Welcome to Fading Memories, a supportive podcast for those of us dealing with a loved one with memory loss. How would your life change if you look, acted, and felt 10 to 15 years younger, regardless of how many birthdays you've had? Did you know that staying mentally and physically active can help our brains to continue to grow and add new brain cells well into our golden years? How do we achieve looking and acting 10 to 15 years younger? With me today is Tom McFadden, author of Stop Acting Your Age. His book offers a step-by-step plan to guide you into a more youthful lifestyle so you can live life to the fullest for decades more than you ever thought possible. Good afternoon, Tom. Thanks for joining me today. Hey, well, thank you so much, Jennifer, for having me. I really appreciate you bringing knowledge to overcome ageism and really giving back and sharing to seniors and elders out there like me, uh, knowledge to be able to make a difference in our lives so that we can live a quality life uh, instead of uh, just kind of waiting around to see uh, how Mother Nature is going to let us live or die. That is very true. I've had uh, family members that have lost their spouse and they're like, oh, I'm just waiting for the good Lord to come get me. And, you know, it takes a long time sometimes. And you think <clears throat> maybe you should stop waiting around and start, start doing something. Maybe he's not ready for you. Yeah. And now I've got a great, uh, little, uh, little course there for them that are people that have lost their, their friend or their mate. Uh, and it's really, uh, I call it how to find your new soulmate. And basically, what you do is that you make a list of like up to 20 things that your soulmate, that what you were looking for, what what would be your perfect soulmate? And I'm talking about just really having fun, but opening yourself up to actually what would be the age, what would be the the height, what would be the values. And, and you go through the whole thing and then you put that out there and then you start looking for him or her. Uh, and then you ask yourself questions like, um, well, if I wanted him or her was, let's say, some kind of uh, uh, romantic, well, where would I go to find somebody that is interested in, like I'm into, but then there's all kinds of things on the Internet. So what basically what you have to do is to, and now at our age, is find that soulmate by making a list. Uh, and then you're not wasting their time or your time. And if they don't, if they don't come up with ten or fifteen, you can check off on that list. Then you you need to find another soulmate, or you haven't found the right soulmate. That makes sense. So backing up half a step, tell my listeners a little bit about yourself. In our phone conversations up to this conversation, you've had a, you've had a lot of lot of experiences. Well, I mean, experiences come with age, you know. I mean, <clears throat> I'll be 80 October the 4th, and I want everybody out there to remember that, October the 4th. Uh, well, I mean, I actually came out here to Hollywood because uh, I, I pursued the the acting world. Um, my Aunt Rosa told me when I was a youngster that uh, one day she was going to take me out to Hollywood because and make me a star because I was special. <laughs> And when I came out here in 1960, uh, I realized that uh, everybody out here was special. So I had to start training myself uh, and finding the knowledge that would allow me to be able to pursue my passion and my career. But knowledge is just a word without action. So I took action, found very good teachers and coaches and mentors, and guest starred over 100 television shows, did 26 Main Street movies, was on a soap opera called General Hospital, and so on and so forth. Then I taught acting for 23 years, and now at my age, basically what I'm doing is that I'm giving back and sharing the knowledge uh, that I have and with seniors, because I want to make sure that, like myself, that we can live a quality life and enjoy our last years here, and uh, why not? Definitely. So was that the inspiration for the book, Stop Acting Your Age? Yeah, because as an actor, you're castable 10 to 15 years younger than your actual age. Uh, And as you go through life, there's always ups and downs and mishaps and so on and so forth. And then I realized that I was not being cast for parts that I used to play because they felt that I was too old or 
or I, I just wasn't getting the attention that I got. And the reason why is because I was not allowing myself to portray the parts that were 10 or 15 years younger than my age. As I said before, you're castable 10 to 15 years younger. So as an actor, it's acting is nothing more than turning the psychology of a character into behavior. So I knew that I had, as a coach, I, I coached a lot of actors how to be able to develop characters or personalities. So I said, why not do that with myself, create my superhero character that's 10 or 12, 15 years younger than my actual age. So I started that. And if you see pictures of my book or something, you'll see that I do not look my age. I'm a product of the product. Uh, and that's the way I started because I, I just didn't want to, I didn't want to see seniors uh, uh, really, really buying into the behavior of being an old person. That makes sense. So in the, your book, you talk about positive aging. Can you explain what you mean by positive aging? Well, I mean, the, the opposite of positive is negative, and we live into, once you become 55, uh, and I know you as a youngster, you, you're, you're, hitting, you're going to be hitting that fairly soon. It seems like that everybody, every marketer in the world loves you. So, but the, the marketing they send you is that they're sending you how to basically to get ready to die. So what, that's what I call negative marketing. Uh, so we have to turn that around and be positive. We're not ready to die. We're ready to live. So that's primarily positive is, is, is basically is for you to start taking action. Action is the lifeblood of an actor, but it's also the lifeblood of us. You have to take action if you want to make a difference in your life and other people's lives. So that's what positiveness is about for me. So basically looking at aging in a positive way instead of just more closer steps to the end. Right, exactly. Because when the closer steps, because the marketers are saying, hey, you know, for $997, uh, we can throw your ashes over the Atlantic Ocean. Or have you got your will ready? Or have you actually, have, have you, do you have insurance? What about the plot? I just got something from a, from a funeral home the other day. It was a twofer. You get two headstones for the price of one. Well, you're inundated with that, you know. Now, AR, ARP uh, is really good for us because they're, they're really one of the only ones that are out there that, uh, that you know, that really look out for us with the, and, 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 and really give back in a way that's helpful with us. But most of the other things out there is just a way for, for them to make a buck, and, they, and we're, kind of, uh, we're kind of the easy prey, so to speak. That is true. So research into brain health tells us to learn something new or do something in a new way. You devote a whole chapter to the inquiring mind. Can you right. give us well, some highlights into how an inquiring mind can help us stop acting our age? Yeah, well, curiosity. I mean, your curiosity is such a wonderful thing. I know when you travel, you, you really use that muscle of curiosity you know, you're looking at different, oh my gosh, look at that tree, look at that bush, look at that bird, look at, oh, here, every, look at the people with their, your curiosity muscle. But then when you come home, you, you kind of turn that curiosity mu muscle off. Uh, so you have to constantly keep feeding your curiosity. Here's an example. Here, here's a good thing that I'll give you an example. There are one third of your time, let's just use that as an example, one third of your time should be doing something that you are giving back, sharing somehow with to somebody that so you have a little more knowledge about this, whatever the subject or whatever the task may be, so that you're actually giving, sharing and caring about humanity, about other people. One third of your time, because it, you'll never, it feels so good to be able to assist and help somebody. There's a lot of seniors that all you need to do once a week, once a month, whatever, is just give them a call. They don't, you know, you can just call them and say, hey, how you doing, Mary? They're, I mean, they will appreciate that because they're lonely and, they, and they're actually, the loneliness is one of the big killers in, in, in aging. The other, the second thing, one third, one third is caring, sharing, giving back, teaching somehow. 
because you have to get out there and teach and, and, and share your knowledge. The second thing is really hang out with quality peers. Now, I know when you, the older you get, the, your peers pass away, you know? I mean, I'm losing people that I've been friends with for years, <clears throat> nearly all the time. In fact, I joke with my wife, I tell her to go down and look in the obit column, if my name is not there, then I'll come down and have breakfast. But, <laughs> so you need to really hang out with peers because it's been proven medically that if you go down the nostalgia road, it's a brain workout. Like, because then you have to pull out of these files when it happened in the past. You say, hey, you remember when the first time you heard Bob Dylan? Yeah, that was on Steve Allen's show. Hey, Steve Allen's show, he really started at Tonight Show. It goes on, what kind of cards you have? Hey, you remember the first kiss you had? What about the date? You know, I mean, it goes on, instead of talking about how's your new hip, or did you get a new replace, a knee replacement? Talk about really basic times in your life that were incredibly, um, you were curious and they were incredibly things that were happening to you at that time. That makes sense. Okay. I, I, I'm in a bicycle club and predominantly all of my friends are older, but you would rarely know that when you've got your bike helmet on, your sunglasses, it pretty much masks your age. <laughs> and we... We we're we're definitely peers on a mental level, even though one of the yeah. guys I like to harass because he beats me on the flats and he beats uh, me on the hills and uh, I tell him I should have an age advantage. He's thirty one <laughs> years older than me. I should have an age advantage, but I don't. Yeah, yeah. And so I harass him that I want to be like him when I grow up. <laughs> yeah, well, tell him, you know, you need that handicap. Now, the third thing, so I got one third, which is sharing, caring, and giving back, teaching. The second third is to hang out with quality peers, not with qu uh, casual peers, because if you hang out with casual people and you spend quality time with casual people, you'll wind up as the casualty. Now, what I'm talking about casual people are the people that are so into dying, where they're constantly afraid of this, or they say that they don't want to do that, or they don't exercise, because exercise is one of the lifebloods of living. You have to exercise. Uh, the third thing that I, <clears throat> that, that I was saying about the spending one third of your time is exactly what you're doing besides exercising, is that you are a work in progress until the day you die. You have to constantly keep learning knowledge, learn, learn knowledge and take action with it. Knowledge is just a word, but if you take, if you learn something, you learn something new, something that's, that's a little uh, scary for you, or learn a new language, or just keep learning, because that helps with the brain, it's, it, it, it stops a lot of uh, uh, dementia, especially with Alzheimer's. Uh, you have to constantly be being a work in progress until the day you die. I, so I believe one that. Third, one third, one third, one <laughs> third. They say you spend one third sleeping, so something's got to give there, it sounds like. You got to <laughs> sleep. I mean, actually, you, 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 the, the body, when you sleep, it actually cleans itself. So you need that seven, eight hours to get rid of all the kind of toxins and stuff we have in our body. Plus, it, it, it refuels and refeeds our imagination and refeeds our brain, refeeds our body, refuels our body. Uh, and it's very important. A lot of times I know that there was a trend a few years ago to be uh, multitasking and, you know, people are so proud of living, uh, being, only being able to sleep five hours or they were doing this. Well, a lot of those people may not be here. A lot of those people have a lot of different illnesses. Yeah, I know. If I don't get a full good night's sleep, seven, eight hours easy, I'm groggy, and my <laughs> brain wants to eat junk. It just wants sugar and simple carbs and all the stuff yeah. that we know is bad for us. And it's, it's funny because you think, oh, I'm hungry. And it's like, no, my brain is looking for fuel because it's tired. That's right. So I, I'm, I'm big on sleep. So kind of in the same vein, and a section that you talk about in the book, you know, we've all heard the phrase, laughter is the best medicine, and we all should know how terrific a good laugh makes us feel. But in your book, you connect laughter and personal health. 
So can you give us some examples of how laughter can help us look and feel younger? Yeah, well, let's start with the first thing. Everything starts, everything that's worthwhile starts with a smile. So I hope everybody remembers that. Everything that's worthwhile starts with a smile. Now, laughter is a, is such a great exercise because what, you know you know a lot of laughter. You have to understand how to laugh. It, when you laugh out, when you throw your head back, that's you're laughing and you're not really laughing. You're laughing in a sarcastic way, so to speak. Yeah, <laughs> that's so funny. You know, mm-hmm. but, you're, but when you laugh, you really want to be able. It, you, that's why you hear the words, he fell down laughing. I laughed so hard, I, you know, I cried. I wet my pants. It, I mean, laughter is a part of our nature, our human nature, that's really a healer. So you want to be able to find that life is funny. If you just start looking around and just start really re- analyzing all the things that you see and do in life, it is hilarious. That's true. So you want to laugh. It's it's you I mean it's so important for you to really have a good laugh every day. You and your husband should have a joke. You should play on each other. You should have a fun laugh. You should have fun time uh, because it it's lightness and ease. Laughter. You're not heavy with laughter when you're sad or you're bored or. You're, there's, you're, you're sick or something, that's heavy. Laughter is lightness and ease. And in any kind of, uh, actually, if you think of a comedian, laughter has to do with, with, with a, um, a rhythm. There are basically three rhythms, okay? Think of any, if, can you think of a comedian that you like offhand? Not to put you on the spot. <laughs> Um, yeah, like stand-up or comedic actors? Well, stand-up. Let's say stand-up because everybody kind of understands stand-up. Oh, I, I love the the comedians that take personal stories. Like okay. talking about the, like the way Bill Cosby was and Robin Williams. Okay. Yeah, okay. They, they took more, more Cosby, but they take their personal life stories, their everyday type stories, and twist okay. them into right. just right. hysteria. Right. Okay. So now if you take... If you take, let's take Robin Williams because w- w- I just want to go through the point very quickly. Robin Williams, his rhythm for laughter, which engaged you, was very staccato. In fact, he made bird-like movements. He was dot dot. He was flying. You you when he when he when he conversed with you when he was telling a joke or a story or or doing some kind of. Uh, 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 a character that he was portraying or improvising, his rhythm was very flying. So if you watch yourself, when you start telling a joke, you want to add that kind of energy to it, like a little bit of rhythm of flying. And your joke will come out a little more, hey, you remember the first time, blah, 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 you know? Okay, that's one, that's a rhythm. Uh, that's the rhythm of flying. The next rhythm is like, do you watch Seinfeld? Do you remember that series? I do. Okay. Well, Kramer, the guy that was the next door neighbor, his rhythm was staccato. He flew into the room. Okay. Jerry was legato. It was uninterrupted movements. He flowed. And George was molding. He was stuck. So those are the three rhythms that you need to be able to find, except the stuck one. You don't want to be in the stuck but you want to add to your when you're telling your story is to or your joke is to add either flowing or flying. That's that's interesting. I'm gonna keep that in mind the next time I retell something or or try to be a little sarcastic with my husband because that's how we keep the mood light. Yeah, good, good. So one of the things I really appreciated the chapter where you talk about the curse of the zone zombie. And I appreciated that because I've known a lot of people who fit that description. And then I've also known a lot of people who don't fit that description. So can you explain to the listeners, because obviously they haven't read the book yet, exactly what is a zone zombie? Well, basically, the zone zombie is you're walking around with, you know, in a daze. It's like like you're the, 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 the series The Walking Dead. 
you're in a zone which is that your head is in the clouds or your head is in the sand. You're not looking at life with your eyes wide open. And you're just so into whatever is happening at the time. Uh, and you're not allowing the other or people, vibrations, other th music, other things into what's going on in your life. So you are uh, you are you're like that kind of zone. You're a zombie. So it's is that kind what of yeah. What... I I kind of think of a zone zombie too as somebody who is re almost a hundred percent reluctant to change and doesn't appreciate things around them. Like, for example, last evening, uh, one of our three golden retrievers, the way she was sleeping on the couch, just every time I looked at her, I smiled. And it's, you know, when you think about it and you articulate, it sounds a little silly. It's like, you know, she's three and a half. I've had her for, you know, just under three and a half years. And it's not anything different than she normally does, but it just, I just took a few seconds every time I glanced over at her and and appreciated, you know, her soul, and and she right. made me smile, and that smile always made me feel good. So I I picture zone zombies as people that are just they're stuck, they're they don't change. Right, you got it. I mean, that's basically. I mean, I mean, you don't have to worry about that because you're not a zone zombie. So to be able to assist other people, you have to be able to understand what they're going through and somehow that if you can assist them or get them to look at life with their eyes wide open instead of walking around in some kind of zone, zombie, some kind of trance. How would you help somebody that's they're caring for somebody with memory loss or other chronic illness and they're just overwhelmed and they're kind they're stuck because of the uh -huh. circumstances not necessarily because they don't want to be unstuck is there maybe some way that we could help them right well the first thing you do is you change the word help because help means you know that's that goes right into the person's brain if they 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 think that they are you call 911 you know, when you go to a department store and the salesperson comes to you and the first thing he says is, what, how can I help you? What do you say? I'm just looking around. That's right. That's <laughs> right. Well, that's the same thing when you go to somebody that's stuck or they're in pain or they, you know, it's very hard for them to look at what they're doing or their habit. Um, so you have to be able to get them to understand that you're there to assist, not to help. And what so about, oh, go ahead. If you change the word help to assist, it's like, how can I assist you? What is it you need? What would be something would make this better for you? Why are you doing this so that I can understand how that I can assist you? And then you have to listen. Makes sense. Um, I was thinking more along the lines of a caregiver. I, I'm in a caregiver support group, which is fantastic. And there's some people that, and I was there and I've found a new purpose, which we'll talk about later. Okay. That's helped, helped me deal with, you know, my mom's memory loss and, you know, my father passed away a little over a year ago and we had to put her in a memory community and, right. and for about a year, it just, it felt like. I was stuck in this zone that I didn't want to be in. I didn't choose any of those paths. And it took a year to get off of it, and you know, I'm still working on it. But I know people from the support group, they just seem to have tremendous challenges. And, it's, and they're, they're in a caregiving routine, which is important. I'm wondering if there's a way of helping them like flip a mental switch into not feeling as stuck as they might be currently. That right. Might, that might be asking a lot there. Well, it, 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 it is because, see, it's like I can show you how to work out or I can, but I can't do the push-ups for you. I can show you how to do push-ups, but I can't do them for you. Darn. <laughs> you, yeah, you can assist somebody to be able, but really you have to elicit from them 
Where is the bleeding? Where is the pain? Now, like with your mother, now, if you could get her to have a to enjoy the game of rolling back time and and really have her uh, give some kind of reward bonus, everybody loves to everybody loves to be rewarded. So you have to bribe her uh, to be able to do certain things or make her aware that if she uh, contributes or she does this that it's going to benefit her grandkids, her great-grandkids. There, there, there has to be a reward for them. It can't be that you're constantly being the parent and then you're, you're preaching or teaching them all the time. They, you, have to still, you have to let them understand that you understand that they are go, what they're going through and you're there to assist to make their life better, more loving and caring in any way that you can assist them then you do that. But if you listen to them, they'll say, honey, I would like to talk about Uncle JY. I don't know, you know? No, that makes sense. The one of you, the You need to get them to really communicate with you. If not, you can't make anybody. It's like that you can't you can you can bring a mule to the water, but you can't make him drink. That is true. And and you kind of give me some ideas on on dealing with my mom because she doesn't have any short-term memory at this point and not a lot of long-term memory. But right. in those two or three minutes of her existence might not quite be the right word, but the part that she's remembering, not parenting is the one thing I, I, I want to get away from. I, I always feel like I'm dealing with a toddler, but that's my mother, and I'm right. sure other people in my situation feel similar. <clears throat> and... Finding well, a way of rewarding her for what she needs to do, or I, I, I well, like that. I'm going to have to revisit, re, re-listen to this phone call and and think on that <laughs> some more. So I hope that gives okay. other people something the, to think about too. Okay, here here here's the thing for everybody out there that's listening. There's one great word, and that word is need. If you say to your mom, honey, mom, mother, whatever you call her. I need you to show me how to do this like you did when you were my age or whatever. Or I need, if you say to her, for example, uh, if you say to her, you need something so that she can feel responsible and good about teaching and sharing something with you, it will open up a door. I don't, it may not open up a lot of doors and windows, but it will open up a door. For example, I'll tell you a little story. Uh, the, I work out the Motion Picture Television Fund, uh, the gym. And this is Motion Picture Television Fund is a campus only for people that were in showbiz. Uh, and there was a woman there that she's a producer, and uh, uh, she's having trouble with her daughter. Her daughter is a teenager, and she says, oh, my gosh, my daughter, she's, I, we, 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 we don't have quality time anymore. And she, is, she, she knows everything, and we fight. I can't talk to her. And she said, I don't know what to, what to do. And I told her, I said, well, here's what you need to do. Need is that you just have to say to her, honey, I need you to show me how to be able to understand Facebook and social media. Uh, if you can just show me how to do that, I need to learn that because of my business, my profession, what I'm doing now. Uh, and I need someone to really bring me up to uh, up to date of what how that works and what's going on. And I really need you to really show me or teach me that. And, and then I saw her three or four months later, and she said, my God, I can't believe you. My daughter is such a mean teacher. <laughs> <laughs> she said, she is so strict, and but I'm telling you, she's good, and we have the greatest time together, and I have such quality time, and I really appreciate you giving me that little bit of advice. And when she left, she said, LOL, which stands for <laughs> lots of love or lots of luck. I didn't know. Actually, it stands for laugh out loud. I'd laugh out loud. But yeah, I do know a lot of people that think it means those phrases. So it's, yeah. I think so, it's. But I didn't get a chance to ask her. I just knew that she was learning the lingo of, of the social media, Facebook stuff. Yeah, I remember going through that some of that with my daughter. She'd, she'd be like, she'd say BRB, which is be right back, and you know it didn't take long to catch on. But it was just funny that that's how she would communicate, and it was. It was fun. Yeah. You know, I only have one one child, so 
it was it was easier to appreciate the stages, even though there was a few you wanted to cut very short because they weren't so yeah. great. Yeah, it's difficult for 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 you for our children because they don't know what to say to us primarily. You know, obviously they say they love us, and but they have their own life, uh, and they 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 expect that when they when you call them or when you when they call you or something that there is something that because of the perception, which is something that I'm really fighting. I really want to put the word out about. The perception of an elderly person is not a crackpot or frail or an old fart or somebody that's grouchy or grubby or frail. I mean, we're just we we feel just as like we were when we were 30 or whatever. Um, and and our, our most of us, our minds are good and facile, and we have a lot of we have a lot of uh, gray power under that in in our brain, so to speak. So. It's important for 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 a senior, an elder, to really stop the perception by understanding that they need to be able to uh, look, act, and feel 10 to 15 years younger than their actual age. So there's a conversation about, you know, uh, hey, Dad, you look great. Uh, instead of them feeling like if they call, they may have to pay the rent or the phone bill or something. I don't know. That makes sense. I mean, I've vowed to never be a grumpy old lady. And you dedicated, <laughs> I, I swear, my, my dad was, he was a grumpy person most of his life, and it didn't get better with age. Yeah. And you've dedicated an entire chapter on attitude. So right. how can someone maintain a positive attitude when life throws challenges at us when we feel the least able to handle them? Well, I mean, you know, that that's, that's a question that's, that a, a, an individual has to you know, there's, there's a very easy general question if some if if something happens you 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 have the opportunity one thing that you're in charge of one thing that you're totally in charge of is, is that every morning when I get up I say to myself I'm in charge do am I going to have a good attitude or a bad attitude it's up to you so if if a person wants to have a bad attitude there's really nothing more than you can do because that's that person's life. That's the way they exist, uh, is to say, you know, it'd be great if you had a better attitude. I'd feel more comfortable around you or something. Or uh, it, 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 Sometimes we take on too much responsibility instead of really dealing with positiveness, is like I said, is doing the three ends. That is like inspiring and informing uh, in entertaining each other and ourselves, uh, we 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 sometimes feel guilty that we're not more responsible for our parents. But there's not basically if you love them, share with them, care about them, talk to them, get them to uh, uh, have uh, you know some kind of joy in their life. Your mother, your mother would be if you would find a ha a, a hobby. Maybe she could knit. Maybe she. You, uh, I just told a, a, a person at the Motion Picture Television Fund that uh, that they should make the person uh, the the photographer, and she has a little camera now, and and now she's got she's she's got dementia, and she's starting the first part of uh, Alzheimer, but she's got that camera. She loves it. She takes pictures, and she's taking some great pictures. So you have to find a way for them to be productive that is exciting because it's all about us. It's, you know, rightfully so. It's all about you. If you are not happy, if you don't like yourself, then you can't really like and love and share your happiness and love with somebody else. You got to like yourself. So you got to, you got to really kind of keep constantly thinking, how can I love myself? How can I befriend myself? How can I like myself more so that I can share that with my friends, my loved ones, and my family? Now, that makes sense. And I was going to throw you a twist on maintaining a positive attitude, and I think you've touched on it a little bit. Do you think those suggestions work for the glass half empty folks, what you were just well, talking about? I mean, yeah. I mean, it's, if it works for you, I don't know what works for them or not, you know. But I know that Oprah, everybody knows Oprah, <laughs> every morning before Oprah gets out of the bed, she thanks herself. 
You know, she appreciates herself. She gets up with a great attitude. Now, people that are half with the glass that's half full, I mean, as long as you acknowledge that and assist them or get them to inspire to fill up the glass, you know, or, or empty the glass, it depends on what it is that you're interacting. What, what is your need to be able to assist them? And what is their need for you to help them? Or, or I mean, if a person is negative and they'll drag you down. Yes, I've been there, and I, I take after my dad, and I had we had an employee who was older than myself, and he would always harass me in kind of a fun way, but it was very honest, and he's like, yeah. you're just like your dad, you're so grumpy, you, you're so negative, you're da-da-da. and I would look at him and think, no, I'm not, why do yeah. you think that, and it stuck with me, and I worked very hard to flip that around because I used to be a glass half empty person and uh-huh. my, I actually said you know I don't believe in half empty half full depends on how thirsty you are what's in the glass That's right. exactly exactly so I just I turned it around and I didn't want to end up like my dad um, I didn't want to be I didn't want people to see me as negative either and since this gentleman did see me that way I I took a step back and and tried to analyze what I was doing that made him feel like that, because obviously if he felt that way, other people would feel that way, and that, that wouldn't benefit my life or my business or any of that stuff. So I, I did make a big turn, and then while my dad was on hospice, dealing with him was so hard because a lot of it was the negative, stubborn, you know, just, whew, it was it was a challenge, but we right. we made it through that. Well, I mean, also you have to ask yourself, what is the hidden agenda? What 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 is the what is his agenda? Why is he doing this? If this is and then if then you then you call up and you you know you say hey I don't appreciate that and I don't want to hear you talk to me like that again. Uh, and if you do, then you know then I'm not going to have anything to do with you. And just call people out on it. You know, getting back to the half glass half full thing. If a person is so hung up on the half glass, then get a smaller glass. You know? <laughs> That's a good point. It'll be full. MBK Senior Communities is dedicated to being the preferred senior living provider in the markets they serve. They create warm, inviting living spaces in desirable locations. They offer a variety of services and programs to enrich the lives of residents and their families. And by getting to know their residents, their personal preferences, and their individual needs, MBK Senior Communities can better contribute to their well-being, and provide care that's right for them. They are committed to enhancing independence and quality of life, serving others the way they prefer to be treated, and providing care that is delivered with integrity, dignity, and compassion. Currently serving the Western United States, but expanding. Why not contact your local community for a tour and see for yourself why most of their residents say they felt at home from their very first visit? You can get more information by visiting their website at mbkseniorliving.com or call 949-242-1400. One constant in life has changed, and I've had quite a lot of change in the last couple of years, which had me questioning my purpose in life because I felt like I was being dragged in a direction I didn't want to go. And I've, I've found a new purpose, a new outlook, and how does your book help others navigate finding their purpose and how does finding your purpose help you stop acting your age well it tells you in the book it gives you a a track to run on you know basically every we i mean you don't get things through osmosis you have to which, which i talk about knowledge and you have to turn knowledge into action and it depends on what you're really interested in it's all about you and rightfully so you, you, you know, what do you want to do? What do you want to be? Where do you want to go? What do you want to contribute? If you ask yourself all those questions constantly, why, what, then to to yourself, you're not asking them to an audience. You ask yourself, why am I doing this? You know, like I used to, I owned a cigarette uh, uh, um, a company that would would help you stop smoking. It was called Butt Out, okay? <laughs> Okay. Now, basically, it shows that primarily what we do 
is any kind of addiction, it's based on habit. Now, with but out, we with the herb, the formula you take, the nicotine was out of your body, washed out and everything in about 72, 72 hours. But the reason people smoked was not so much that the craving of nicotine, it's basically the craving of the habit, you know. Uh, they would they would pack the cigarettes. They pick up. They would light it a certain way. You'd hold it a certain way. And what I did it was I teach. I taught you how to be able. If you held the cigarette in your right hand, then if you asked yourself, "Do I want a cigarette? Or need a cigarette? Or desire a cigarette?" Then if it's if you wanted a cigarette, then you had to hold it in your left hand. And then by breaking the habit, slowly breaking the habit. The person didn't stop smoking. He just didn't want to smoke or she didn't want to smoke anymore unless it was a need or a desire. That makes sense. That's so actually always, a very interesting approach. So change the habit. I mean, you know, if you, to, it's easy to lose weight. All you got to do is stop eating. <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's it, 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 anything that anything that's harming you you know, you just got to stop doing. It. Find that, find another habit that takes you in a different place than constantly doing over and over and over the road of doing the same thing. That's definitely not an interesting road. So, where can uh, my listeners get your book? Well, they can go to stopactingyourage.com. Wonderful. And do you have now, any last comments for us? Well, I mean, basically, what the comment that I have is is to enjoy. I mean, life is you don't get a. It's not it's not like a rerun. It's not like a. You're not going to get a residual. You're here. Enjoy it. Look look uh, how you can enjoy life fully. I mean, really, every morning you get up, just think how lucky we are. I mean, my gosh. My odds are getting to be 80 is, I don't know, 80 trillion to one. So I am so lucky. And if people realize how lucky they are, then they will enjoy it and more. Enjoy it. Look out. When you take a walk, don't just walk. You know, smell, the, look around, see the green, look at the, the, the trees, listen to the birds. Really love life and live it. Now, that's excellent advice. And as some of my listeners know, I have my paternal grandmother will be a hundred in less than a week. And oh, I'm gonna ask her a hug for me. Yeah, it's amazing. It's there's times I think, oh my goodness, <laughs> I can't imagine another forty nine plus years, but I'm I'll get there. But I'm okay, gonna ask so. her if that's the if that's what she's done all her life. Because her life was not easy. She grew up right. poor and you know, obviously in a hundred years a lot has happened. So right. I'm going to ask her if she just, if that's her view every day, is just to enjoy life. Right. And then also another thing you can do is that you can, I mean, we all are interested, or we should be, in our legacy, okay? With technology moving as fast as it is, you know, you'll be able to actually live to be 100, uh, but it may not be a quality life. You can live to be 100 or more because they've got all the kind of, uh, technology, medical things that can keep you alive. You mean it may be on a machine, but they can certainly keep you alive. The the thing that what is happening is you need to see if she would like to record her youth when she first came, like um, this, like in a covered wagon. You understand? Mm -hmm. That you was know? her mother. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But there's stories that she can tell about her mother and when the first time she saw. This or the first television set she saw that was six inches and, you know, where she was and have her record that because the technology is becoming so advanced in 20 years. All the words, all the all the data you have recorded, they'll be able to turn it into a hologram and she'll be able to sit on the couch and you'll be able to ask granny, nanny, whatever. <laughs> you can ask her what it was like when she was 12 or 10 or 15 or 20 or 30 or 40 or 50, 60, 70 years. You know. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a lot of decades to live through. And I think about all the changes that have happened in my 50 years and, and double that. It just, you know, blows my mind. I know. I, it's, I mean, I, in my age, I mean, I was... I was born right before the war in 38, 
You know, I saw the first TV, telephone, all that stuff, medical thing. The, you know, there. when I was a kid growing up, there was polio. There was all kinds of different diseases that kids had and chicken pox and malaria. And uh, one of my best friends got polio and, you know, uh, and then TV. I mean, all the things that I'm looking back and seeing all the things that it's just it's incredible and it's moving so many light years faster now mm -hmm. so so ask her to record or talk to her about it or say hey you know what i'd like to i'd like to hear some of those stories granny what do you call her nana yeah nana say yeah tell me a story nana do you remember when you were 15 or the first time you met greg grandpa or whatever and she'll they'll start they love to tell stories I will definitely do that and definitely record them because I've, I've been recording visits with my mom for the podcast and yeah. and I really actually appreciate going back and listening even though I have to remind her that, okay, all the pictures of the blonde kid in this family <laughs> album are me and all the pictures of the brunette girl are my sister and there was only two of us so you'd think she could keep that straight but she doesn't oh. and, you know, when I was... It was funny when I was there, and then it was kind of hard because it's like, really? There's only three blondes in the family, one in each generation. How can you not remember that I'm the blonde daughter because I'm still blonde and I'm still sitting here with you? But then I go back and listen to it, and it's it's humorous again. So I, right. I know I'm going to appreciate the, the recordings. And when we moved her into the memory community, it dawned on me, as I mentioned on the phone the other day, I'm a portrait photographer is my other career. And I realized that if we didn't take pictures of my mother, right. she would have her life in pictures would have disappeared when my father died. So I make it a point to, um, I use my cell phone and if you put it on mute, it doesn't make the camera shutter release noise. And uh -huh. so you can get pictures of them doing things without disrupting them with the whole you know, look at the camera and cheese and all that silly stuff. So I've gotten oh. laughing. I've got her interacting with her friends. Oh. And I know everybody will appreciate those when she's gone. And yeah, and then and, and then record some her her talks because 20 years from now, they'll be able to listen to that. They'll be so curious and interested in what was life like. That is true. It's definitely, okay. definitely, it's nice to get another insight into some of this stuff because you know it, it makes me realize I'm on the right path and then there's some other things that I can do and I appreciate having that that be brought to my attention oh great well I appreciate you and thanks for really you know putting sharing out there so that we can turn old into gold and turn ageism into sagism so uh Thanks for having me, and I really enjoyed talking to you, Jen, and I, I appreciate what you're doing. So uh, keep me keep in touch, and, and let me uh, keep me informed, and tell me when uh, uh, you know when we can talk again, and and tell everybody out there act stop acting your age dot com. Sounds terrific. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Bye bye. Bye. Tom's book was an excellent read. If you're trying to find a way to live your life in a more positive way, I truly recommend this. It's not just about looking and acting younger, it's about feeling younger. So a couple of takeaways to keep in mind as we wrap up. Surround yourself with optimistic people to fill your life with positivity. Find your passion in life. It will give you focus, determination, and will help you stay young. Take care of your body and it will take care of you. Yes, sometimes that means you need to eat a salad and stay active. Don't get into molding, which is staying still, feeling stuck, and being stationary. If you're feeling stuck, find ways to mentally unstick yourself. And reading this book might give you some thoughts that might help with that. You should never stop learning. Life is a journey filled with lessons. Paying attention to these lessons and reading will keep your brain young, dynamic, and healthy. Experience the world, even if it's just the world outside your door. Be open-minded about change. If you stay stubborn to modern, youthful ways, you will grow old and stuck in your ways. 
Remember, we can't learn as much from the younger generation as they can learn from us. Be rememberable. What is your legacy? How do you want people to remember you? If you were to walk into a room with a lively party right now, chatted some people up, then left, what would they be saying about you after you walked out of the room? You are in control of how you want to be remembered. Lastly, live life with no regrets. In this era of our lives, we can't afford to have regrets. Never stop thinking about you, what you need to do to live a quality life. If you've enjoyed what you've heard today or in previous episodes as well, please go to wherever you download your podcasts from and rate and review us. This allows others to find us and allows us to share the wisdom and support we've garnered over the years. Thanks again. See you next week.